Hey everyone, so in this video, we're gonna start deriving our mathematical model of this exponential firing from neurons. And again, these are called the Fitzunagumo equations, or I should say that these are the equations that we are after in terms of deriving. So we're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna basically derive these equations to try and model exactly what we wanna see happen. So we can start playing with some of these uh, parameters that will govern basically these action potential firing events. We're gonna borrow, borrow some ideas from population modeling to help us out. So we'll see things like logistic growth and exponential growth and other aspects as well. And this will basically give us a system that is called a relaxation oscillator. And in the next video, when we start exploring these solutions, we're gonna start seeing why these are called uh, oscillators to begin with. So if you remember from our past video, the main idea here is we're gonna concentrate just on two different mechanisms or two different aspects. The first thing we're thinking about modeling is this so-called fast aspect. And this was our actual voltage or our membrane potential of our neuron. And the other aspect we're gonna try and model are these so-called slow mechanisms. And these are the blocking mechanisms that try to suppress these action potentials from firing or just reducing, like we see on the right-hand side here, reducing our voltage signature back to where the cell wants to be at its resting value. So these are the two aspects that we're gonna model, and we're gonna break this up into four different steps. So the first step we're gonna do is we're gonna do a scaling procedure on the potential or on the voltage to make this a little easier mathematically. The second thing we're gonna do is really focus on that voltage equation. The third thing we're gonna do is focus on the blocking mechanism equation. And finally, the fourth thing, we're gonna put it all together. And we're going to be able to see that once we put these equations together, we're able basically to think about some slight perturbations or slight variations on this Fitzunagumo equation to model different scenarios that may be present. So the last thing I also want to mention in terms of these equations and where we're going, sometimes people call this as the mathematics of sodium channels. And when people talk about concentrating on these <clears throat> so-called fast processes, um, this is really talking about the fast processes in terms of the voltage increasing significantly in a very short period of time, basically due to the sodium ions. So these fast processes, once again, are associated with our sodium ion dynamics. And on that note, let's jump into some of this math. So like I said, the first step we're gonna do is basically scale our potential. And this is again, just to make our system easier to work with. So for example, on this left side or the right side here, we see that there is a maximum voltage So we have a couple different aspects. We have a max voltage. The other voltage I wanna point out is we have our resting voltage, which we can call V rest. We can also define this threshold potential or this threshold voltage. Okay, and what I wanna give us a sense for this threshold voltage is once the voltage in that neuron 
increases to that level or higher, this is where we start seeing that positive feedback loop occur, where more and more sodium ion channels are opening and allowing more and more ions to basically flow into that neuron. So after, once the voltage is greater than this threshold voltage, we see that positive feedback of more and more sodium ions flowing in. Now, the reason I wanna bring this up is we have all these real units, the real voltage max, the real resting potential, this real threshold voltage, but what we are going to do is basically put these into more scaled units. And what I mean by that is, we can think of this as when V equals zero, and notice I'm using a V tilde to recognize a new variable, meaning this isn't the same definition of voltage we had before. This V tilde equaling zero, we could think of as our resting voltage. We could think about, you know, it'd be nice if V tilde equaling one was our max voltage. And the third thing, it'd be maybe convenient if we just had, you know what, some value A, which was our threshold potential. And now what we're trying to do is basically take these units and move over into a system where we can think about just our V tilde or our scaled units. And the way we're gonna do this is basically just by trying to define what V tilde is in terms of our regular old Vs. So really, this is what is V tilde, our new scaled variable, in terms of the original voltage potentials up above. And for us, the way in which this can work is actually just through a nice linear relation. So for example, to do this, we can define our V tilde, which is a function of the original Vs. And we're just having a linear relationship between these items. So we need to define some slope times V, the original voltage V, plus some unknown B. So M and B here are just our slope and our y-intercept basically for this line. And we can use some of the information up above to get our system of equations to help us find what M and B are. So for example, the first thing we know, well, you know what? When V is equal to, I guess let's just start off at V rest. We want this value to be equal to zero. In our new V tilde scaled units, but when we put this into our original, this would be okay, that unknown slope that we need to solve for times our original units in terms of the resting voltage. So we have this one equation now that V tilde equals zero when our actual voltage is at V rest, and then we can start solving for M and B except we don't have enough in information yet to solve for M and B, the slope and the intercept, so we need another equation. So we can do is say, you know what? Well, when V tilde, when the actual voltage is at its maximum, V equals V max, we said that this value was equal to one. So our scaled variable V tilde equals one, when we plug in, Vmax in for our actual voltage. <laughs>
So we have this system now of two equations and two unknowns that we can solve for M and B. And the whole reason we're doing this again is so we can work in these V tilde kind of units, which is just things going between zero and one, which seems a lot easier than all these other kind of V max, V rest, V threshold type values as well. So let's solve this system of two equations and two unknowns. So from the first equation, we basically get that M times V rest plus B equals zero. In other words, we can solve this equation because V rest is some actual value now. We can get that B is equal to, well, what it looks like it's equal to is minus M times V rest. So now if we have our slope, we automatically get our intercept. But we can plug this into the second equation, which is actually M times V max plus B equals one. And again, we're just gonna plug in what we just found for B from that relationship. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have M times V max plus, well, I guess that's actually a minus now. We have a minus M times V rest. And that whole thing equals one. And then we can just go ahead and use our algebra. We have M times the quantity V max minus V rest after we factor out an M from both, both of those terms. And then it looks like what we can do as well, we can just divide both sides by V max minus V rest to get M. And now once we have that value, we can get B. Which is just equal to minus V rest times M, which we found to be V max one over V max minus V rest. So all this to say, we can go back and forth between these units now if we want to work in the V tilde universe, where things are going just between zero and one, or if we want to go into this more actual units of voltage, including the V max, the V rest, and all of that jazz. So just to clarify, we now have three special values for V tilde. V tilde equals zero is our resting potential. V tilde equals A is our threshold potential. And now mind you, we can actually figure out what A is in terms of the original units for V threshold by using that linear relationship we just derived. And finally, V tilde equals one is our max potential. So we're gonna work in these V tilde units just to make things a little easier. So this plot on the right hand side that we've been looking at is really in terms of our original units. So let's go forward and make a plot for these new units now. So this associated plot, the way in which it would look, if we have something like V tilde versus time, it would look like we're starting off at zero 
Again, that's our resting potential. And our action potential there will increase and then decrease. And mind you, it's going less than uh, zero, just like it overshoots in the other case beyond its preferred resting potential, but then it's gonna go back up to zero. So at this point up here, this would be V tilde equals one, which signifies our max potential. And then we also have this other value of our threshold somewhere in between. So we have the similar looking thing, except now we're working really between zero and one, which should hopefully make the equations look a little bit more um, easily digestible than what we had previously. But this plot on the right is really giving us that idea of what we're going to work with. We still have the same things happen here. The cell wants to be at this resting potential of V tilde equals zero. And it's going to try and use those blocking mechanisms to start knocking down the voltage once it starts increasing beyond zero. When we have V equals A, this is where that positive feedback occurs. And we'll just say this is where more sodium ions flow in. Because more and more of those voltage gated ion channels for the sodium start opening up the higher that potential gets. And once we reach that top point, this is where the blocking mechanism really stops the flow of the sodium ions. And we see the same thing happen. Between this entire region then, the blocking mechanism is basically decreasing all of that voltage. We have those ion channels being blocked, so no more sodiums going in, but we have those potassium ion channels open that are allowing those positive potassium ions to flow out. And then once we hit this bottom point here, this is where those blocking mechanisms turn off. and the cell again goes back to its resting potential. Those blocking mechanisms reset. So on that note, we're gonna be working in this V tilde units. Let's start deriving some of these equations. So this is the second piece. Let's look at the voltage equation. So what we want to happen is number one, there's a couple aspects. Basically, we want this positive feedback to occur where more, more kind of sodium ions flowing in are causing the voltage to increase. In other words, more voltage, faster increase in voltage. So what this actually sounds like in terms of differential equations, the first item we're going to use in our model is just that, you know what? Well, this sounds a lot like if we have a rate of change of our voltage, it sounds like our voltage is just increasing based on its previous value. So the higher the voltage, the faster this rate of change. And again, we're thinking of this being a greater than one or greater than zero kind of voltage now, this V tilde. So the higher values of V, the faster V is going to grow here. And this looks just like a standard population growth or exponential growth. 
That's kind of one thing we can do. More voltage, the faster increase in voltage we see. Now, another aspect that we can start thinking about is, well, there is a max voltage. So we only want the voltage to grow to some maximum. So what this sounds like to me is, we can actually start using some of these other population dynamics that we know, like the logistic model. <clears throat> we can have dV tilde dt. We can take our original term that we had up above, but now we can add this other term that looks just like a logistic term or part of a logistic term. We have the one minus V tilde. And this is really sort of part of a logistic term. And again, this is really enforcing that V tilde equals one will turn off that growth. Since we see when we have this one minus V tilde, if V tilde equals one, well, that right-hand side of that differential equation is zero. That voltage has stopped growing. Now, the other aspects after this is we're gonna take another idea from population growth modeling but this time we have to start thinking about that uh, threshold voltage. So I wanna spend a few seconds thinking about this because like we had before in these previous models as we started looking at, our solutions would just grow if we had that first aspect. Once we incorporate that logistic term, the solutions of our model will start looking like standard logistic solutions. We see them increase and then basically just taper off. Now, what do we want to happen though around this uh, threshold voltage? Basically, what we want to see happen is if If the voltage is less than this threshold voltage, the neuron doesn't fire. Those voltage-gated sodium ion channels don't open up, so there's no positive feedback. But on the other hand, if our voltage is greater than that threshold voltage, the neuron fires. We start seeing those sodium channels, the voltage gated sodium channels opening up, more and more sodium going into that neuron, more of those channels opening up and more and more ions flowing in. So how can we start thinking about this? So basically the idea that we wanna see here is we want to start thinking about a solution to our differential equation that has three possible equilibrium. We have an equilibrium at V tilde equals A, which seems to be a cutoff point. We're beyond that threshold. We know we want our uh, voltage potential to increase, but if our voltage is below that threshold, we want our solution voltage to then just decrease away since the neuron isn't going to fire. So in other words, here are two possible equilibrium we want to happen, or we want to see this difference in dynamics if we're landing in these different regions of V tilde values. So if we're somewhere above that threshold voltage, we want our solutions to increase towards that V tilde value. However, this would, again, this is the situation where V tilde is greater than our threshold, but if we're lower than that threshold value, we want our solutions to decay. 
because that neuron is not firing, we don't have that positive feedback. So hopefully at this point, we're thinking, how can we start inserting this third equilibrium into our model that we already have? And well, this idea we can actually borrow from something we've seen before called the Ali effect. Which was the next extension of our logistic model. Instead of logistic, where it's a quadratic right-hand side, the Ali effect has a cubic right-hand side. And it allows for this exact type of behavior. We can start putting this threshold value in between that carrying capacity and extinction. And that threshold value says, hey, if our population is greater than that threshold, population flourishes. But if the population is less than that threshold, which would be this case down below, our population crashes towards that other extinction event. So we can use the same ideas here for neurons. And in fact, if we work out the math, that cubic right-hand side to just insert this next term would be, well, we have the same type of thing. We have a V tilde, except the new term we're going to put in is a V tilde minus A. Otherwise, we still have that other logistic term hanging out as well. And this is one possible way that we could model this kind of voltage signature coming from an action potential. And really, this is very similar to the Ali effect, which we saw earlier in the course, having these three equilibrium. And for us, just looking at this plot up above here, really what this looks like in terms of the equilibrium is that we are going to have two stable equilibrium and one unstable equilibrium. And we can start looking at this if we just plot down things on our number line. We have, you know, V tilde equals zero, V tilde equals A, and we have V tilde equals one. And if we start looking at the direction in terms of this uh, 1D phase plane or 1D phase portrait, we can see that if our solution is in certain ranges of these values, we're going to tend towards one of these different equilibrium points. For example, if our solution is slightly greater than A, well, we're going to head in the direction of that carrying capacity, in this case, the maximum voltage of one. If we are somewhere below that value of A, well, our voltage is going to head it back down towards zero since that action potential doesn't fire. So this is giving us the same type of phase portrait that we've seen before for this Ali effect or depensation effects, just like we talked about in population ecology. The other thing that I want to mention in this case is really what this allows us is to see that there is, if we make a plot of dvdt versus V, so this is literally plotting the right-hand side of that differential equation as a function of V tilde, we see that this is actually just going to be a cubic for us. Where we're going to have a region where the solution decreases and a region where the voltage increases. And again, this is really just regurgitating the same information from that phase portrait. When V is less than A, that voltage is going to decrease. And again, this is just showing you that the sign of that right-hand side of the differential equation will be negative for V values less than the threshold. But if V values are greater than that threshold value, we're going to see the voltage is increasing. And it's literally because the right-hand side of that differential equation takes on a positive value. So we see an increase in V. So what I want us to recognize here is we're going to use this equation, dV dt, or sorry, dV tilde dt, in terms of this cubic polynomial right-hand side. We're going to grab this, and this will be the signature 
for the voltage equation or the potential equation for Fitsunogumo. But before we go any further with this equation, we get to talk about the third thing, which is that sodium or channel blocking or the slow blocking mechanisms. And again, this is going to be the thing that's trying to drive that voltage back towards the neuron's resting state where it wants to be. So we're going to define a couple things here. We're going to let W equal the strength of this blocking mechanism. Now, what we see from this plot on the right, even if this is the plot in units, because again, we can go between units and these V tildes anytime we want with that linear relationship we derived. But what we want to see happen is whenever that voltage is increasing or that voltage is positive, since V tilde is going somewhere between zero and one, we want that blocking mechanism basically to increase as well. So the blocking mechanism increases in strength as V increases. So if we're looking at this in terms of a differential equation, what this means is, well, our strength of our blocking mechanism should be its derivative or its rate of change is proportional to, well, whatever V tilde is, and maybe there's some growth rate. We'll call that epsilon. And again, this is some form of exponential growth, except we're thinking probably that epsilon is something small so that blocking mechanism doesn't just shoot up really fast. But the other thing is this blocking mechanism can only get so strong. So what we think is we want to try and take away from this V tilde value in some way. And it's going to depend on how strong that actual blocking mechanism is at some point. We don't want this blocking mechanism just to get stronger and stronger and stronger. We want its strength to be capped off at a value. And that's basically going to matter on what the actual strength of the blocking mechanism itself. So we're going to see this battle between more voltage is telling that this blocking mechanism gets stronger, but the stronger the blocking mechanism gets is basically saying, hey, I can only get so strong to knock down this voltage. So the way we can do this is basically look at a battle now between how fast this is growing due to that voltage increase and how strong the blocking mechanism is. So the way in which people model this is they actually take away from V tilde and they say, we're going to have this battle now between V tilde and the strength of the blocking mechanism. So we're going to look at the difference of those quantities. And people introduce this other term, basically minus gamma W to have some proportionality constants. So we can look at how strong that relationship actually needs to be. So the second thing is basically saying that the blocking mechanism only gets so strong. In fact, if it's very, very strong, it doesn't want to get any stronger, which is why we have that negative gamma W term. However, the higher the voltage, the stronger that thing wants to get. So we see this battle again. So a few key things to note here. When V equals, or when V tilde equals zero, what dW dt looks like is it looks like, well, minus gamma epsilon W, which is less than zero. So in other words, when 
um, the cell is in its resting state, that blocking mechanism is just getting weaker. It's just decreasing in strength. The second thing we can notice is that there's an equilibrium. And again, that's just when the right-hand side equals zero. And that's just when our voltage strength is equal to gamma W. So it's basically saying at some point, this doesn't want to grow anymore if we are sitting at a value V tilde equals gamma W. The right-hand side is zero. The third thing to note is that epsilon changes the rate that this equilibrium is approached. In other words, when we see this relationship for the equilibrium, there are no epsilons here in terms of that equilibrium value of V tilde equals gamma W. But we see an epsilon basically saying how fast we can get that blocking mechanism to bump up its strength to start balancing out that voltage increase. So this is really the blocking mechanism equation now that we're going to use. And there's only one little small thing before we actually get the first form of the Fitsunugumo equations. So putting it all together, if you remember, we have our voltage equation that was given by that right-hand side having that cubic form, V tilde, V tilde minus A times one minus V tilde. We had our blocking strength equation, epsilon times V tilde minus gamma W. And now, well, if we look at this, well, our voltage equation doesn't have any dependence on that blocking mechanism, which it surely has. And the easiest way to do this that people do is they just subtract off that blocking mechanism from the voltage equation. And this is basically so the voltage feels the effect of the blocking mechanism. And this describes the firing of an a, a firing of a neuron. But as we'll see when we start exploring solutions, this only describes maybe one firing event. And the reason I say maybe is it depends on what the initial voltage is. If the initial voltage is greater than A, or the initial voltage is less than A, we'll determine what type of um, time evolution of the action potential we see in this case. Now, these equations up here are the Fitsunugumo equations. So we did it. And there are many variations, <clears throat> excuse me, on these equations themselves. So for example, here's the original equations. 
let's actually go ahead and just write down some of these variations. I'm just going to change that minus W. So these are the original Fitzunagumo equations. Now people have modified these equations quite a bit to include other terms to basically start looking at other dynamics. Like I said before, these equations as they stand could maybe only describe one firing event. So some things that people said was, well, what if I start applying currents, external currents to this neuron? So what the hope of this is, is to basically see other real behavior of neurons where when people actually ex, uh, expose a neuron to a applied current, they will see that neuron just repeatedly fire after firing events, one after the other. Of course, if certain conditions are met, but we see instead of just one pulse or one action potential firing, we'll see many in succession. So the equations as they stand now actually are very much the same, except with a few slight modifications. And by slight few, there's really only one modification. There's this inclusion of an applied current term. And what this applied current is doing is really just, you know, putting more and more of those positive ions into that neuron, basically in the way we would expect of basically, you know, flowing electrical currents. And the hope here is to see this uh, neuron fire repeatedly. And the last case that people have done is we'll take the previous case and just say, you know what? Neurons are at certain location in space. We want these actual action potentials to go off and communicate their signals to other things. So people have studied the Fitzunugumo equations with spatial dependence with an applied current. And what these equations then look like is we want to see basically that this X potential signature from this one neuron goes off, propagates, and maybe tells other things to do stuff, just like we would expect of these electrical impulses in our body to send those messages everywhere they need to go. So this form of equations looks very similar to our previous, except there's going to be one new included term. And this new included term is going to be a term that describes basically the diffusion of these electrical impulses from these action potentials diffusing outward from this neuron. So we're going to introduce basically part of our diffusion equation. And now because we're assuming that, well, V tilde is a function of both time and space, spatial locations, we need to think about all of these derivatives as partial derivatives now. And this is our Fitzunugumo with spatial dependence. Again, where this term comes from is just like we saw from our random walks and diffusion. This is just part of the diffusion equation.
And actually, if we take this third case, what this is actually called, because we see the diffusion equation there, we actually get to call this a special name. This is what's called a reaction diffusion equation. Because we see the diffusion equation basically hiding between this term on the right hand side, dvdt, and that spatial second partial derivative term. That is our original diffusion equation, but we have all those extra terms in the middle. So what this is saying is we have a diffusive process that's reacting to something else happening, hence the name reaction diffusion. So with that, I hope this was a nice introduction to how we can start modeling these action potentials coming from neurons using this kind of Fitsunagumo framework. Again, this is just one way in which people try to model these types of dynamics. There's a few other ways in which people really start thinking about neuron to neuron communication using things like the Hodgkin Huxley models. And what's really interesting about this Fitsunagumo equation, it's actually a re, uh, reduced order model of those Hodgkin Huxley equations. So even though this might seem like a very simplistic method or simplistic model, it actually agrees with a lot of other models that are already out there in some limit. So in the next video, we're gonna start checking out solutions to some of these equations. Check it out.